Welcome and good morning, everybody. My name is Rachel Dimery, as you all know, and I am the chair for this reconvened hearing to determine a notice of requirement by Queenstown Lakes District Council to designate land for the purposes of a wastewater pump station and storage at Beacon Point Road in Wanaka. The application reference is RM220819. As this is an online hearing, I can see that you're all doing this, but if I could just remind you to mute your microphones if you're not speaking, uh, and you can choose if you wish to have your cameras on or not, um, unless you're speaking. Can I just check at this point um, if we could do a bit of a roll call and who we have on the call? Uh, and also, when you tell us your name, um, I'll just call out who I can see in the participants and you can tell me who you are because some of them have cryptic names. Um, you can tell me whether you have any time constraints we need to consider as we proceed today. So to start out, we have um, Trish Anderson. Ms. Anderson, as you know, is the administrator that has organised the hearing for us and is assisting. I also can see we have Chapman Tripp, who... Yes, um, Ms. Appleyard, and I have um, Mr. Anderson with me, who has filed some evidence um, in the room with me, but not on Zoom, but watching on YouTube, I have Ms. Storm McVeigh and I have Lucy Forrester. It's just a little bit crowded to do it around the screen. And I... I'm ho hoping that we have Mr. Giddens um, on Zoom's or Teams somewhere as well. He has lodged some evidence. Uh, Brett, are you there? Yes, he is. I can see him. Thank you, Ms. Appleyard. Um, moving on, I can see we've got Mr. Cam Jones, engineer, who um, presented at the initial first two days. Hello. Hello. Uh, and I've got Rewa Sartori, who uh, prepared the memorandum for the Section 42A. Hi. Hello. I also have someone called... Simon. Yep, good afternoon. I'm the project manager for QLDC. Ah, uh, thank you. Simon, what is your last name, please? Uh, Brackstone, B R A C K S T O N E. Thank no you. Ev no evidence presented, just uh, observing. Thank you. I also have Tony. Good morning, uh, Tony Sycamore, 205 Beacon Point Road, Submitter. Good morning. Uh, then I'll have Mary McConnell, Ms. McConnell, the section 42A report. Yeah. Hi. Hello. Uh, Mr. Steve Hewland, who has prepared the engineering addendum for the section 42A. Good afternoon. Hello. Uh, I have Lynn, who is a submitter, I recall. Good morning, Lynn. Beacon Point Road. Thank you. 211213. I also have Danielle Kelly. Yes, good morning. That's Jeanette Campbell and uh, Rosa Gavey. We're unfortunately appearing as one of my chambermates, Danielle, uh, with her name rather than mine, but um, we're here for QLDC as a requiring authority. And also appearing with a slightly odd name, we've got Mr. Baker. Um, he's, I think, CH. I can't quite make it out with my eyesight. Something rather number one. Yeah, <laughs> SLB, Steve Baker. Ah, that was the uh, one. Thank you. <laughs> and um, as well as Mr. Brackstone, I've got Mr. Darby from the council who's just observing, unless there's any questions of him. And then I've got Mr. Hay um, standing by to answer any questions as well. 
Thank you. Uh, there's a few more people joining who perhaps may be observers. I can see now Dave McEwen. So Dave McEwen, are you, are you um, there? Could you just perhaps let us know if you're here to observe um, or who you might be? I can't hear. Um, a Dave McEwen was a submitter. Thank you. And I also have iPad 3, William McDonald. Sorry, Dave, you're um, observing. Ah, uh, thank you for coming. Sorry, just had a settings issue. Settings issue. No, thank you. Thank you, Mr. McKeown. Um, if I can assist, William McDonald is one of the submitters who um, I represent, so he will just be observing. Thank you. I think that covers everyone. Uh, so thank you and welcome, everyone. Uh, so I didn't hear from anyone that we have any time constraints, but uh, we do have, I think, an hour to an hour and a half set aside. And I just want to confirm that I've taken, I've read all of the additional evidence in the Section 42A addendum, so we'll take that all as read and I don't require any summaries, uh, just for efficiency. Uh, before we get any underway, uh, I just, Note that I do have the um, memorandum from Ms. Appleyard and Ms. Forrester in response to Council Section 42A that was filed on the 20th of April. And I just wish to discuss this briefly now that as I read it, that there aren't any directions sought in the memorandum, but I wish to understand, Ms. Appleyard, are you seeking that Mr. Hewland's uh, Section 42A is excluded or? Um, well, it's one of two things. As, as a first priority, we'd probably seek that it be excluded. There's some pretty significant natural justice issues with this new evidence coming in in a Section 42A report um, after all the submitted evidence has been lodged. Um, and it's pretty fundamental evidence that should, should have been part of either the applicant's case or in the original Section 42A. So there's some fairly fundamental Section 42 uh, sorry, natural justice issues. So that can be dealt with in one of two ways. Our preference would be that uh, the evidence is excluded. Um, but if that is not to be the case, I would want to have Mr. Anderson have the opportunity to respond to it. It is as that it's come very late and it's come after his evidence. Um, and if that was the way the commissioner wanted to go, um, I have emailed through this morning the comments that Mr. Anderson would want to make. There's six paragraphs, um, but I didn't want to circulate that um, if the commissioner was going to make a decision to exclude the evidence. So it's either one or, or other of those things. Um, but I would like to hear QLDC wearing its regulatory hats explanation for why this has come in in a Section 42A report um, this late. So if I could just ask Ms Campbell uh, to address this. Um, when I, the issue I can say here is that it has come from council as the uh, fulfilling its roles as a um, reporting function and its regulatory function, not as the requiring authority. So I don't know that this is actually Ms. Campbell's. Um, no, I, I, I to was respond, but I would be interested in yeah. Ms. Campbell in, in your views and um, on this, please. 
Definitely. Um, Mr. Hewlin's um, additional material in the 42A report addendum is effectively 10 quite short substantive paragraphs after he set out the proposed earthworks and the scope of the assessment, et cetera. Um, in terms of what Ms. Avriar's just said, um, she says that it's fundamental evidence, and if that's the case, then the right approach is certainly not to exclude the material if it's fundamentally important. If you're minded, Commissioner, to give the submitters additional time to respond to those 10 paragraphs, and particularly given that that material appears to have already been prepared, then we'd certainly have no objection. That said, um, I disagree with the characterization of it as, as new and late and et cetera, but, but I, I, I don't think that's particularly material. There's no, in my view, no natural justice issue currently arising, but if there is one and the submitters seek an additional, seek to produce additional material, we have no objection to that course if you consider it to be appropriate. Thank you. So, um, Ms. Appleyard, when I received your memorandum, it wasn't clear and the, there was no express request for it to be excluded. And I had in my previous minutes directed that council respond to uh, the additional conditions on earthworks. And I'm... Um, that is the substance of what Mr. Hewland has provided, and he has qualified that to say what is outside his expertise. But without, um, given that you've got some comments from Mr. Anderson in response to that, because part of it did read as rebuttal evidence, I, I would like to see that information that has been prepared. Mm. So that's being circulated this morning. I think Ms. Anderson has it, um, but we didn't want to pass it any further than that until you've made your decision. No, I haven't sent it to anybody. Um, under the guidance of Rachel Beer, she said to wait till we came to the hearing. So I, I can look at that now and we'll discuss it um, when we get, when we. Um, discuss the earthworks part. Um, just in terms of efficiency, in terms of the questions I have, I have questions obviously relating to the future environment that the planners have covered in quite some detail, and that leads into the noise issue. Um, and then questions for Mr. Anderson, primarily, and Mr. Hewland on the earthworks and I'm just wondering if for efficiency, if we might cover off um, first the issue of the future environment with all of the planners, if, if you agreed with that, um, so that we might let Mr. Hay go and then cover off the more substantive issue of the earthworks, or would you prefer to go in the usual order with the um, requiring authority and Mr. Baker and Mr. Hay first and, and then um, proceed with the submitters and the, the council's reporting officers. Um, Commissioner, the council is requiring authorities entirely in your hands as to a sensible order. Whatever is most helpful to you is fine with us. Um, uh, in terms of that first issue that you've indicated you'd like to explore the um, the state of the future environment in terms of the point of measurement for noise. Um, Ms. Satori helpfully um, provided some advice in her material that the modelling demonstrates that the requiring authority will comply with the relevant standard at the point 4.5 metres from the boundary where the yard would allow construction of dwellings or additional residential units. And on that basis, I'd be very happy to short circuit the discussion and say that we'll accept measurement at that point. 
Um, Mr. Darby can tell it to you himself, but he has double checked that point and confirms that it's correct. So, um, although there's been quite a bit of evidence in relation to the, the point of measurement, given compliance is achieved at that point, then um, I'm happy to cut through that discussion if that's helpful. That is helpful. Uh, the one question I had is that I had picked up, Ms. Sartori had specifically uh, spoke about um, covered 201, 203, and 211 Bacon Point Road, but Mr. Givens, er, Givens Giddens, sorry, evidence also um, specifically mentions 198, 211, and 213, and his opinion that there could be attention, um, extensions or accessory buildings constructed on those properties. And so if that were the case, I need my questions from Ms. Sartori and Mr. Hay are whether or not there would also be compliance at, at the, on those properties at the nighttime operational noise levels. Um, can I just check, Mr. Giddens, can you hear us? I understand you were having some problems. Can you hear us now? Yes, I'm back in the game. So just to summarise, I, I won't have any questions for the planners if, if Ms. Sartori and Mr. Hay can confirm that, as Ms. Campbell's outlined, that compliance can be achieved with the nighttime noise limits for operation at 4.5 metres from the boundary at the properties that Mr. Giddens has listed in his evidence, which is 198, 211, 213. 201 and 203. Um, I'll ask, I'll, I'll ask, um, I've temporarily, oh yes, I can see Mr. Hay there. I'll ask Mr. Hay to uh, answer that question, Commissioner. Um, it's my understanding. Yeah, my, my understanding is all of those uh, properties would be at greater distance from the roadside cabinets uh, than the ones that we've specifically addressed, and the noise levels will therefore be lower. And I'd agree with that. Okay, so on that basis, I, I won't um, need to keep Ms. Sartori and Mr. Hay. Um, any longer uh, because that is the only matter in dispute as to what the nighttime operational noise level should be and where it should be measured from. So uh, thank you. Can yeah. I just ask with Mr. Giddens, Mr. Giddens is happy with that before we leave that topic. Are you happy, Commissioner, for him just to be asked that? Yes, certainly. Thank you. Yeah, no, no issues from my end if, um, if the acoustic experts um, are all in the consensus that the noise, the, those properties are further away um, and that noise would be less, then um, that seems sensible. Okay, that being the case, um, thank you. Uh, so I won't torture thank the planners you. with lots of questions about the future environment, but thank you for your assistance. Uh, Thank you. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Right. So now, uh, moving on to the um, issue of the additional earthworks conditions and the evidence from Mr. Anderson and Mr. Hewland. Uh, I think what I would like to do, uh, as there is no, um, perhaps I should read Mr. Anderson's response. Now, if we just have a brief recess, so I could do that and then I could rethink the questions we may have on that. Um, but 
as we don't have any evidence from the requiring authority on, on the um, issue of geotechnical um, matters raised in Mr Anderson's evidence. I, I don't have any questions for Mr Darby on that. Um, the, the issue is primarily questions for um, Mr Anderson, so I'd like to see what, what he's prepared. Um, can I just, um, I think that's probably a sensible suggestion, and if Ms Anderson can circulate um, the email to all parties, and you can just have a look at how long you would need, um, it would also be helpful for us if Mr Hewland could actually, because we are making some assumptions, um, outline for us what his qualifications actually are. Um, and in particular, his engineering qualifications as well as the geotechnical, because we've made some assumptions and we may be wrong. So yeah. that would be helpful as well. Thank you, Ms. Apple. Yeah, I, I do have noted in my questions here. Um, appreciate we're jumping around a bit, but I'm trying to be efficient and just address the issues that, that are covered in the additional evidence. So that is one of my questions for Mr. Hewland. Um, and also, so perhaps we'll just cover this first, what information he's considered, so we can understand that as well. So if I could just ask Mr. Hewland at this point to um, respond. So Mr. Hewland, would, I'd like to confirm your qualifications and experience firstly, but also confirm whether you reviewed the evidence of the requiring authority and the submitters, including that of Mr. Anderson in terms his evidence in chief of 8th of February, as well as just this additional evidence that Mr. Anderson has prepared. So if we could, if I could understand that from you, Mr. Hewland. Uh, yes, I did review Mr. Anderson's uh, evidence of, uh, on both occasions. I was only requested to uh, review his evidence. So I um, didn't review all of the submitters evidence in any great level of detail. Um, I uh, obviously did look through things with uh, elements of relevance, um, but yeah, I focused on Mr. Anderson's evidence. And, uh, and just to be clear, that includes his 8th of February evidence, which was his evidence in chief presented at the hearing in, in February. Yes, yes. Okay. And, and could you just outline for us your, your qualification and experience, please, Mr. Hewlin? I have a Bachelor of Engineering degree in Forestry um, from how many years ago that was when I was back at university. Uh, in terms of relevance to this, I um, have been a land development engineer for uh, council, initially for Lakes Environmental. Um, I was the principal of that um, resource management engineering uh, department for three years and I've subsequently been uh, contracting as a consultant in the same area for another what, seven or five years or something like that in the last uh, five years at least. Um, yeah, so I'm, uh, that's my relevant experience in relation to that. In addition, I have um, undertaken the necessary training to become a suitably qualified, experienced professional for the um, environmental management plans. And I undertake those for private clients and review those on behalf of council as well, since that system has been implemented three years ago. And that includes the preparation of erosion and sediment control plans. Yes. And okay. So in that case, thank you, Mr. Hewlin, for that. I will now uh, check um, if Ms. Anderson right. could circulate. I have, I have just circulated that. Uh, if there's anyone who hasn't received that, could they just let me know? Um, I've sent it off to anyone that I think has been involved in the hearing. Uh, so if they could just let me know either via email, um, whether it's come through or not. So I've received that. You did a while ago, but I've, I yeah. didn't realise I was to send it to all parties till now. So oh, I have you. just done that. 
Um, just before you all go and read it, um, Mr. Anderson's picked up a typo. If you just want to um, tell us what it is, Mr. Anderson, in paragraph one, there's a QLDC still not failed addressed. It should, should just read QLDC has still not addressed. At the bottom of paragraph one. Sorry about that. So the sentence QLDC has still not failed. Yeah. Just still, well, not still not addressed, addressed the issue. Yes. Okay. Still not addressed. Yeah. yeah. No, that, that, that's fine. So uh, I'll just uh, have a quick recess now. Uh, let's just say five minutes, um, as it's not too long. And then we'll uh, come back.
Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for pausing. Sorry, the recording's just recorded. Um, thank you for pausing. I've considered Mr. Anderson's additional comments. That these uh, comments just come back to some questions that I, I'd like to just ask Mr. Anderson uh, now, if I may. Uh, as you've said in your additional comments, um, Mr. Anderson, you've commented on um, that you strongly disagree uh, with the um, contention that um, the works are not significant and, and may not have um, impacts on uh, adjoining properties. And I wanted to clarify with you, and I, I think this is clear from the comments there, that the main concern is on the construction of the wet well and the potential effects due to groundwater pressure that will act on the excavation. So it's during construction, going to those depths, that there is a safety issue that has not been adequately addressed. Is, is that correct? That, that's one of the issues, Commissioner. Um, if, you know, Mr. Hewland in, in his latest evidence that I've set out now suggests that the wet well may be as much as nine metres depth, which is deeper than I had considered before in the calculations in my uh, evidence in chief. So that if those groundwater pressures that, that Becker found uh, in their investigations back in, I think it was 2020, um, continue to act upwards on the base of the excavation, which is only going to be um, 10 metres, we're only going to have about a, a one metre layer. But the, what, what will occur is that base can rupture upwards and suddenly flood the excavation. If somebody had, happened to be down there at that time, it would be a very dangerous and, and uh, a, a help or safety threatening incident, which is why I've got a little bit more strided in my language as we've gone along in, in these different submissions, because it's not being picked up by council. The, the other aspect, of course, related to that is um, looking at the ORC consents. From a technical point of view, what I would have anticipated is that the contractor would be, and the designer would have expected to relieve those groundwater pressures by putting wells down into that deeper um, aquifer and that sandy gravels, um, maybe to a depth of say 15 metres, which of course is deeper than the ORC uh, consent um, permits. And I've set out the number of my evidence in chief. They were only allowed to dewater to 10 metres, which does not get them into that underlying groundwater system where the high water pressures are coming from. The, the other aspect, um, if an excavation is nine metres deep, that is significant. That's like standing two or three storeys up in a building and looking down. If you think that a, a, a single storey can be three to four metres between floors, just to gain some perspective, and you look down, that's how deep this hole will be. It's going to be right up against private boundaries in, a, in an urban area, so clearly any... Um, supporting ex, uh, around the excavation. I think sheet piles are proposed here. There's always going to be some inward deflection. You know, you if, if you're excavating in the ground, you're changing the stresses within the ground by creating the excavation. There's always a strain that's set up in the adjacent soil. So that has the potential to damage not just private property, but any adjacent services that are buried there. I don't see any conditions that are, around that. <coughs> Um, yeah, so it's so it's a, a significant um, excavation if it's as deep as nine meters in a an urban area. And of course, the the, the final point, and in, in uh, going back to my evidence in chief, is that the seepage models that Becker used to assess the environmental effects of of groundwater drawdown only assume that dewatering is going to occur within the excavation within the the realms of the sheet pile wall. If they have to dewater, as I suspect, will below the you know below the silt layer at say twelve to fifteen meters depth, that has not been considered. You know that will that will involve uh, groundwater drawdowns over a much wider area. Now that, from what I've seen, hasn't hasn't been considered to, to date. And I think the last aspect I would point to in the conditions 
that was sent through after the hearing, there's one there where there will be a review of the um, excavation support process seven days before the contractor starts work on site. And in my opinion, from a, a, um, just a purely contractual point of view, that's poor practice to, to have the contractor, assuming he then engages as a professional geotechnical engineer to have a look at what's proposed and then discovers these issues that I've been talking about. In my view, that sets the council up for a claim. I've got time delays where the contractor says, I've got to revise my schedule. You never told me about this. And, and here's my claim for all these extras. And I think, that, as I've said in one part, the council would be in quite a poor negotiating position at that point. So there's a sort of a timing of review issue which um, concerns me from a technical you know, contractual standpoint. Thank you. So just um, backtracking a little bit, um, when you talked about the potential deflection and, and impacts on adjoining properties and services. Mr. Hewland has commented that um, you had um, said in your additional evidence that you'd expect to see uh, conditions on ground deformation monitoring, but he um, has said that um, that's effective for slow processes, not for a sudden um, process like you're um, suggesting. Could, could you explain this um, from a geotechnical point of view and your expertise, whether, whether that's correct or, or whether you disagree? Yeah, well, well, well I disagree um, fundamentally because there's, there's two aspects. One is from, let, let's assume, uh, there is a geotechnical designer here designing the sheet pile wall. You want to know, you know, and you've got a nine metre deep excavation, if that's how deep things are going. That, as I've said, that's a substantial excavation. So you would want the contractor to be carrying out some monitoring to demonstrate that the solution that you've designed and, and the contract is now installing is working correctly as per the, the design assumptions. So that's one aspect. The second aspect is... And in a situation like this, where you've got private property very close to you, and, and you know, and I've had many instances of this, there's always the potential that you get a claim for damage to the adjacent property, and someone points at your your construction activity as the source of that damage, and then sometimes that can be real or can be vexatious. Council would be in a poor position to negotiate um, if it received a claim from uh, an adjacent, you know, private landowner saying that that the um, the construction activity is the source of damage in their place, so they haven't got any form of monitoring, whether it's vibration monitoring or displacement monitoring of the ground to demonstrate that they haven't caused whatever the problem is being um, complained of. So I think it would be a prudent activity for QRDs and themselves to make sure they've got enough monitoring around to, 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 to demonstrate um, that things are working technically as designed and that if there are any claims for, for damage, that they are able to demonstrate that it's not uh, arising from their activity. Thank you. So the concern there is more to do with, I'm just trying to understand the probability of whether you think there could be damage from, from an excavation of this size. Well, I'm thinking, well, yes, we, we, we're seeing an excavation, I think. Um, well, the dimensions that, that have been presented are up to nine metres deep and seven by seven metres square. But we're talking the wet well here, and there are other excavations, but we sort of focus on that on that really deep one. Um, it, it's it's very difficult, even with using sheet palms, to install them into the, the ground and get absolutely no movement of the ground outside. Um so the seven by seven meters, I think, you know, what we saw on site, that's going to become very close to the to the private boundary and there may be damage to a wall. Um, there, there's always, yeah, it's while we think geotechnically we'd like to wish these steep sheet piles into the ground and there'd be no movement when we excavate down um, of the of the ground and behind, that's a very difficult thing to achieve. We obviously, as engineers, look to limit the amount of movement. Um, by putting in, you know, stiff support. And, and I've said in my evidence in chief, there isn't any definition at the moment of exactly how that 
um, excavation, the, the sheet piles, as the excavation is made, will be supported. I'm, I'm, I'm guessing they might try to use or put in place um, some sort of steel bracing on the inside. Anchors have been used in the past, like there's, there's another scheme I was involved with in Wanaka, just down the road where they use tieback anchors. Um, so to ensure that absolutely no movement occurs and, and damages, um, it, it, it could be services, a brittle service in the ground, you know, there's a pipe there, an, an AC, and I'm not sure, but it may be fractured. And then, of course, a, a private uh, wall close by may, may become damaged and there could be a flame. So it's just, yeah, it, it's just, it's, it's such a simple thing to do. It, it's easy to install. And then you've got good hard information about exactly how your excavation performed. Especially as I keep saying, this is a deep excavation. And at the moment, it's not clear to me how they're going to achieve that excavation with the current conditions and current proposal. I haven't seen any, any, pushback on, on my concerns to date. So that, that heightens my concern about what people are proposing here. Thank you. And in terms of um, the comments you've made in your evidence in chief and the additional evidence about the information involved, can you just confirm for me how many notices of requirement you've been involved in um, as an expert, either for the proponent, the requiring authority, or, or as an expert for the submitters? Um, honestly, I, I couldn't. I've done many expert witness um, cases, insurance through to the High Court uh, for, for district plan changes involved in Red Zone here. Um, been through many mediations. I've got another one tomorrow, a settlement conference that will go all day on a, on a long term dispute. Construction disputes, Mars and City, I can probably refer to that. That's in the public domain. Um, that was one that went badly wrong for the, the, the council. In terms of numbers and notice of requirements, honestly, I, I can't think of, of any others. Maybe the ones I was acting for, so well, yeah, that was actually a notice of requirement. But I can assure you that I've done many expert witness roles in the geotech engineering space in a, in a variety of um, legal forum, whether they be adjudications, um, arbitration, even right through to the International Court of Arbitration in London I, back in 1998. That was a, a six-week long thing involving a project in Indonesia that had gone horribly wrong in an, involving an excavation too, I might add. I think the Commissioner might be asking a question around the level of detail is that that's expected for an application. Is that where the question's coming from, whether it be a resource consent or a notice of requirement. Is that? That where? is right. And, and um, where are we going on? Because, um, yeah. I appreciate we're a little bit out of order here, but I had just had one final question for, for the planners on that. Um, yeah, so it's, a, it's around what you see here in terms of the level of detail that's being provided, um, maybe whether it's a notice of requirement, whether it's a resource consent, but for an application, um, authorising somebody to do something, if you'd like to comment on, on how this one measures up with the others you've been involved in. Yeah, well, what I can see uh, from a geotechnical point of view, um, a number of, of glaring uncertainties around just, just the dimensions of excavations. How are people, how, how deep is this thing? There's a lack of precision. And, and as I've said, there, there is a lack of how people are actually going to achieve the excavation that they are planning within the consents that they've been issued. And I've referred to the IRC thing. So I do find this one, to be honest, um, a little unusual that these details have not been shut down. Um, I, I, the, the fact that they still exist this, this stage of the proceedings does surprise me. And another legal precise process that I have been involved with, and there have been many, said any inconsistencies in the evidence would be addressed pretty quickly before it gets um, submitted. So I'm a bit surprised to see that. I, I hope I'm answering your question. No, no, that, that, that's helpful. Point, I am surprised that these fundamental safety issues are surviving to this day. Issues of constructability have still not been addressed. Thank you, Mr Anderson. I understand that. Uh, sorry, I'm just keep going here. 
I don't have anything further for you, Mr. Anderson, but thank you for preparing uh, that additional um, set of points and, and for assisting me this morning. Yeah. Um, just, I'm not sure where um, the Commissioner is intending on going next, but I'm just wondering if you wanted to finish with us as the submitters, whether um, you just wanted to hear from Mr. Giddens or whether you'd like to hear from him later okay. after you've talked to Mr. Um, Hula. So I don't have any uh, further questions for Mr. Hewland. And right. what, what I was going to propose next is that I um, speak to all three planners. Sorry, this is a little bit inefficient. That, but that's I'm fine. That's but, fine. Um, out of order, but I'm just trying to focus on the key questions that I, I still would like addressed and group them together. So um, if I could now just move to Mr. Giddens, Mr. Baker and Ms. Ms. Connell. Uh, so as you would have all heard, there are some considerable questions raised by Mr. Anderson about the lack of information uh, to do with the excavation for the wet well and the AST trenches. Um, and what I would like to hear from each of you, and I um, propose if we just go in order of Mr. Baker, Mr. Giddens, and then Ms. McConnell, uh, um, whether in your view this is fatal to the application and the application should be, with, um, the notice of requirement should be withdrawn, or whether it would be possible for the notice to be confirmed and for this type of um, these aspects to be dealt with through the outline plan process. So if I could just ask Mr. Baker to first respond to that. Um, my view is that it's not necessarily fatal to the to the designation. Um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Anson has, has raised these concerns and um, so I guess the application had uh, included information for an outline plan but I guess it's getting to the point where you might decide that an outline plan still needs to be submitted um, and I think those are questions, those are matters that could be addressed through the outline plan. So just expanding on that, how would it be addressed through the outline plan? Would there need to be different conditions and a, a process to allow that to be addressed? Uh, well, you couldn't put, you can't put conditions on the outline plan, um, but you could re require that an outline plan be submitted. Um, and then obviously there's the there's the process where the, the outline plan would be submitted and the, the information would be provided as part of the outline plan. Council would review that outline plan, request changes to be made. So there is that review process to request the changes to be made to the outline plan to address those matters. If they hadn't been addressed first up um, and then information submitted. And if and I, I'm not saying that um, this is where I'm going. I'm just trying to understand the uh, options here. Would you change the recommended conditions if, if that were the case? Uh, so would we change the recommended conditions that are sitting in front of the, the, that the you hearing? Offered up at the 28th of March. Sorry, I'm just looking back through the through the conditions. I mean, there's a whole, obviously, suite of earthworks conditions proposed on the um, now that have been put forward. Um, I don't think those conditions necessarily need to be changed because there's still the there would still be the requirement for the review of the um, 
the earthworks uh, processes, uh, you know, the, like the, the the protection. So I don't think those conditions necessarily need to be, not all of them, certainly not. I mean, you, there might be a need to, to maybe tweak some of the conditions, um, but I don't think they necessarily need to be changed wholesale. How would you provide for a process because there is criticism in the um, memorandum from Ms Appleyard and Ms, um, Ms Forrester around um, sort of councils and inability to certify something that if you haven't already seen it, so if geotechnical issues were addressed, how, how would you um, deal with with that matter that's been raised? Well, I, I guess if we go to one of the, the there is a condition that actually does a, does provide for the peer review of of the earthworks um, supported by retaining walls and if earthworks exceeded a height of three meters, um, if they have features that require specific engineering input, there is actually that draft condition twenty two and twenty three. The condition twenty three there does actually provide for council to review. So if the council needed to um, have a geotechnical professional provide a review of those earthworks, then that would form part of the review. Would you would. see that happening at the outline plan? Could you just explain how you would see that happening? So a geotechnical view would be submitted and then it would be reviewed as part of the outline plan process? Well, in actual fact, I guess if, if we stick with the conditions on the designation as they are, then they, they're conditions that have to be complied with. Whereas if you think about the outline plan process, the outline plan would be submitted, council would review it. If they needed a geotechnical review, then they would do that and they would request changes back to the requiring authority to make those changes. So I guess, and of course, it's up to the requiring authority to accept or, or, or not those changes, right? So maybe the, actually the conditions on the designation are a, are a, are actually a, a, a better way to deal with it because there are conditions on the designation. If you don't comply with them, you don't comply with the designation. And the condition actually requires that review and council could, could contract a, a geotechnical professional to undertake that review prior to the works happening. So in actual fact, I guess that's just changing my answer slightly from, from earlier. Um, the condition, I think the conditions on the designation actually probably provide a more certainty. And in terms of the appropriateness of confirming the designation, if we don't know this information now, do you see a problem with, with that? No, not necessarily, because if the council do their, from the regulatory side, undertake a review and if they contract um, a, a specialist a, a person to do that review, um, they're not going to give the engineering review approval before prior to the works happening if they're not happy with that. And so changes would need to be made to the to the excavations, to the um, to the design, to the, to how they're protected to to stop the the um, some of the issues that Mr. Anderson has raised potentially. Thank you, Mr. Baker. Um, I don't have anything further on that. Now I'll just invite Mr. Giddens uh, to give his view, please. Right, thank you. Um, so just to just solve your question, right, is whether um, Mr. Anderson's findings are fatal um, and should the notice be withdrawn? I think I have thought about that quite a lot just in the course of um, post hearing and, and seeing all the information coming back and forth. Um, my understanding is that the evidence from Mr. Anderson is essentially uncontested. So it, it does create a problem in terms of what the proposal is and what that scope is. Um, I've done a lot of um, notice requirements and um, designations and the scope of, the scope of a, um, a notice is set out in its proposal and it's refined through its conditions. So your proposal needs to be clear and not only that, your conditions need to be clear as well. Um, if they're not, um, your scope, your proposal's um, wishy-washy and um, you've got a fundamental issue. And that's, that's essentially where I see here. There's a big information gap, which is probably my main concern. Um, if 
a lot of this information was addressed up front. Um, I'll probably take a different view, um, but I think where we're sitting at the moment is it appears to me that Mr. Baker agrees that there's an information gap and seems that, that he thinks that that can be resolved through the outline plan process. That's not the process, in my view, to be addressing deficiencies in a notice and a designation. Um, that's essentially a process to be confirming the final details that's already been approved. Um, getting, getting to the specifics um, of that original proposal within that scope, I don't think it overcomes the issue that there's not enough information on the geotech and the risks and, um, and, and what implication that may have on changing the proposal. Um, that seems to be, be quite um, fundamental from my end and, and I would probably conclude that it would be fatal um, to where we're at at the moment. Thank you, Mr. Giddens. Uh, I'll just ask Ms. Yeah, McConnell just, now. Just, just actually, sorry, um, Commissioner, if I can just add a couple of comments just on the conditions that, um, that actually reflect those issues. A lot of the commentary throughout them refer to general accordance, uh, far as practicable. Um, uh, yeah, there's a lot of, lot of conditions here which are very uncertain. And even when you look at the information that's, that's deemed to be provided through those conditions, I can't see anything here that still would give any certainty that um, the earthworks would be plugged um, and submitters and even um, the consenting authority would be would actually know what they are assessing. Um, that seems to me to be the big, uh, the big uncertainty in this. Um, Commissioner Giddens, I'll just ask Ms the comment about general accordance, is that not fairly common in consent conditions? No, Rather than strict accordance, because um, once detailed mm. design occurs, usually those, those are not the plans that are, are, are put in with uh, uh, an application. Yeah, it's, it's interesting, because if you asked me that question about five years ago, I would have said general accordance is very common. I've seen quite a big shift now to um, in accordance with plans, and especially QLDC in particular, um, yeah, that's that you're basically what you're putting forward um, essentially is the proposal. Then you generally have the conditions that um, you just have to have some wording along the lines of subject to the amendments that arise from the following conditions um, that then set perimeters as to what may change with from those approved plans. Um, it just seems to me there's a lot of loose terminology throughout the conditions, which is quite unusual. And, and do you think that? If uh, there is a difference, however, between a resource consent application and a designation where you have a uh, second safeguard through the outline plan process, mm. is there a difference there that, that's relevant? I, I don't think so. If um, I've just got section 176A in front of me. When you, when you go to the outline plan, it's um, 176 subsection three that specifies um, what an outline plan must show it's actually quite limiting um, it's um, you know your height bulk and shape location of the work likely finished contour vehicle access circulation parking landscape and then any other matters to avoid yeah, matters. it's to me um, you know you're quite constrained by that once you get through the hurdle of um, knowing whether you've got a notice or designation or not Could this issue come under any other matters? Uh, a geotechnical, uh, it is one of the key matters we have, as you've said, that's uncontested evidence. Mm. So would it not be appropriate to, to consider it under that as it's clearly a matter that needs considering? I think it goes too far outside the scope of what was originally proposed. I think if the if there was a lot more geotechnical information in the original proposal and, um, and I guess the disparities weren't as far as they are um, currently. Um, I probably would see less issue, um, but given the disparities, I think that's uh, fatal. Thank you, Mr. Gillins. Uh, I have nothing further on that. Thank you. I invite Ms. McConnell, if she could similarly respond uh, with her opinions, please. Hi. Um, so, uh, 
I to respond to your question, um, uh, Commissioner Demery, I um I don't believe um this new information or the information pre um, presented by Mr. Anderson is fatal uh, to the um to the the NOR. Um, I. I do believe it can be addressed through conditions on the construction of the wastewater pump station and um, what more recent you know, was, um I have been um, processing, we, we have been putting on um, construction related um, conditions and then um, operational related conditions um, and so when an outline plan is lodged, say for the construction, they um they need to you know address all the um, relevant conditions, and then once it's complete, they need to make sure they're compliant with those operational conditions. Uh, on page ten of my um of my addendum, um, we've put in conditions based on Mr. Anderson um, and Mr. Hewlin's, Mr. Hewlin's advice. Um, we put in condition 25, 27 and 28. And so 25 um, B is, should the site conditions be found to be unsuitable for the proposed excavation or the construction methods, then um, a suitably qualified engineer um, will submit those, um, those, methods and we will have uh, so basically work stopped to stabilize the site and then in addition um uh condition 28 which was um a new condition um recommended is that the works will stop immediately um if you know any cracking movement or distress is um is uncovered during works um I I know who you've just asked um, both Mr. Baker and Mr. Giddens whether whether an outline plan of works is uh, sufficient or suitable to address these issues. And I, I know Mr. Bay, uh, Mr. Giddens um, said that you know one seven six a is um, is too light on whether these these matters in particular can be addressed. Um, I also want to remind um, uh, the question of Mr. Giddens that we also uh, that we, we expect all that material um, required by 176A is submitted with an outline plan, but we also require the um, requiring authority to provide evidence that all the conditions are met. So it's so there's two two kind of checks and balances when an outline plan comes in. So depending on the level of conditions, an outline plan can be quite detailed. So just going back to your suggestion about um, the new conditions there, I understood that Mr. Anderson was critical of those conditions because it's certifying something, you how can you certify something that you haven't already seen, um, that it's new information coming, sorry, that actually was um, in the memorandum from Ms. Appleyard, um, that certification generally implies that your checking something or certifying something that you're already saying that it's consistent. And so if it's new information, is, is that really certification or, or, or a different process? Um, I would I'd right now say I'm not at all experienced in the certification process. Um, I, I don't know. I've never experienced, say, when new information comes in, perhaps that question might be for someone like Mr. Hewland, who is experienced in the certification process. I, yeah, I don't know how often it is that new material comes in at that stage. Okay, thank you. Uh, no, thank you. I, I don't have anything further, so thank you. Okay. Go. 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Murray, uh, Commissioner Murray. Um, I just a note, I have to leave at 1.15 for um, another appointment that I can't move. Um, if you have any further questions, I'm happy to respond in writing. Uh, thank you. I don't have any further okay. questions. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, I don't have any further questions on any of the additional evidence of any other parties. And I've previously addressed in my minute uh, the timeframes from for the reply, and I propose uh, that that those timeframes don't change unless uh, unless Ms Campbell uh, wishes to change that. If, if we could just discuss that now, uh, where to next? Uh, yes, the requiring authority is happy to provide its reply by next Tuesday as you originally directed. That's no trouble. Okay, that being the case, uh, I don't have any further questions for any of the experts or, or parties. So thank everyone for uh, their attendance today and assisting me. And once I have the reply, uh, the be a decision issued in due course. So thank you all. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you.